if every intersection had a dancing cop, traffic wouldn't seem like such a grind, more like a bump and grind. Unfortunately, most intersections don't have dancing cops. Welcome to The Tomorrow Show. I'm Mo Rocca, and this is the future of traffic. Are you all right, sir? What would have happened if the safety belt had not been there? If, if it wasn't an automobile accident, I would have gone right through the windshield. Seat belts. Crumple zones. Airbags. Anti-lock brakes. And this year, attention alerts for drivers nodding off. All of these safety innovations have taken the danger out of driving, right? Then why did more than 37,000 people die on American roads last year? And worldwide, traffic is the ninth leading cause of death. For 15 to 29 year olds, it's the number one killer. So who's to blame? The fault, dear drivers, lies not in our traffic lights, stop signs, or OnStar, but in ourselves. That's right, we're not nearly as good behind the wheel as we think we are. It's been called the Lake Wobegon effect, uh, where all the children are above average. If you've got a room of a thousand people, ask who here is an above average driver, most people would raise their hands. And that's, you know, I'm no statistician, but that's probably mathematically impossible. Considering how long some of us spend stuck in traffic, you'd think we'd be experts. But Tom Vanderbilt, author of a book on traffic, says we don't know the first thing about it. What are the most dangerous driving conditions? Well, you know, we, we would think that it would be something like ice and, and rain and things like that. But studies have actually been done that show that, for example, February is the safest month to drive in the United States. July turns out to be the least safe. A majority of crashes, I should point out, you know, happen on clear days, on dry roads, sunny conditions, sober drivers. You know, again, the, these are conditions we think are safe. That's because we pay the most attention when conditions seem the most dangerous. And when conditions seem safest, that's when we chat, fiddle with the car stereo, and primp. Humans tend to overemphasize novel and exotic risks. My uh, father-in-law last Christmas got me this thing called the life hammer. If you were to plunge off a bridge into a body of water and you were trapped in your car, you could reach for this device and shatter the inside of your windshield. You look at the advertising for this thing, it says providing peace of mind for the driver. As if there was nothing else to worry about except plunging off a bridge into a body of water and being able to bust out from the inside. Meanwhile, a uh, high percentage of crashes are caused of people simply falling asleep. So my father-in-law probably should have gotten me a box of no-dos. No, most accidents don't involve plunging into the water. But here's one real cause for concern. 50% of all cases of head trauma come from accidents on the road. Would it help if we wore helmets when we drive? There's a product in Australia that was called uh, the motoring helmet. And this, of course, didn't do that well. You can't go to Walmart today in the US and find this uh, product on the shelves. Dr. Wilde, can I offer you a lift? Yes, you can. Up the street, please. For Dr. Gerald Wilde, it's not a helmet that would help. It's using the old noggin. A professor of psychology at Ontario's Queen's University, he believes street signs that make us feel safer actually make us drive more carelessly. And now you're not suggesting that I ignore the street signs. No, of course not. But don't rely on them 
to the extent that you believe that the traffic lights are thinking for you. You <laughs> should be the one who is thinking. All right, there's a hippie with a skateboard. What do I do? Watch out on both sides of the street because they are difficult to, con ah, to control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are difficult to control. These kids don't know what they are doing. So you must take responsibility for their well-being. Well, wait a minute. Should there be a sign that says hippie skateboarding zone? Would that yeah. help? People who manufacture signs might recommend that as a traffic safety measure. In fact, in some places, traffic signs are being run out of town. It's a movement called Naked Streets, and it's streaking across Europe. Well, it turns out I had some time on my hands, so I've come all the way to Drachten in the Netherlands. And to get the full effect, I'm going to drive through one of those dreaded traffic circles, one without any traffic signs. In this way, you think, well, what's happening here? There, what, what am I supposed to do? Oh. And you drive slower and you start thinking and reacting on people instead of signs and regulations. Mishka Ketelar is Drachten's town alderman in charge of traffic. There are about uh, 22,000 vehicles per day passing this uh, junction. She spearheaded the conversion of most of Drockton's four-way intersections into roundabouts, with traffic lights nowhere to be seen. When there are traffic lights, people think they are safe, but there's only one needed to, to drive through red, and you have a deadly accident. When this circle was a four-way intersection, between two and four people died here every year. Since the roundabout's construction in 2003, zero people have died. Zero. That's because people actually pay attention and communicate with each other. The net result? An environment that's safer for drivers, that's safer for bicyclists, dank you well, and that's safer for pedestrians. And if one day in the future, we decide we just have to talk on the phone, surf the web, and eat breakfast behind the wheel, well then, Tom Vanderbilt has an idea. If people really don't seem to want to devote their own attention to driving all that much, maybe the solution is to simply you know, take their hands away from the wheel. Two, one. Yes, automated navigation systems are in development at universities from Stanford to Carnegie Mellon. cars that drive themselves. Is that a safer future? If we take the lesson of the aviation industry, I, I, I would see why not. <coughs> and people are free to do all the texting they want. A tantalizing future prospect. But until then, there's no substitute for paying attention. It's not only safer, it's really quite lovely. Well, I think so too. Nice to, nice to hear that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. It's a pleasure to watch traffic with you. <laughs> Stay on the sidewalk. There you go. Some people might think that being a dancing cop isn't that much of a workout. It is, dancing is the most strenuous exercise you can do. I've had numerous injuries doing this. I couldn't walk for a week because of my sciatica. I cracked the bone in this wrist. I uh, hyperextended my elbow. I also slightly separated my shoulder another time. And you don't have to wear a dance belt, do you? I, I wear a I wear a jock. Okay. You call it a jock. Yeah, dance belt. At city ballet, they'd call yeah. it a dance belt. Oh, okay. But yeah, no, I no, wear no, one. whatever. No, I mean, uh, yeah. when in Rome or right. in Providence, yeah.
And you're doing this without any formal training? Right. I go to the schools. I tell the kids that they all have a gift inside of them. And it can be anything. Me, it was to perform. Always wanted to uh, perform as a child. I, I got out of the service, but I needed a job. I ended up a police officer. Then one day, I had to do traffic for 45 minutes. And I guess the, the little boy inside of me came out. That's a two-way twist. That's the, my windmill, I call it. Oh, the windmill, OK. Then I go sometimes into my butterfly. Are you ever concerned that the dancing might be a distraction and might create some risk of danger, of collision? Well, it, it may, but I think it also makes me more aware and makes the people in the cars more aware of me being out there because of the moves I do, because they pay more attention sometimes. People are paying more right. attention. It's up to me to make sure that I don't do something crazy. Uh, and I've been doing this so long, it's been over 20 years now. Well, I mean, if you went into like full Baryshnikov and started doing those fuetes, you know, that thing where you're spinning around so well, fast, I, I do a blur. That. Yeah, I do that. Really? And that's not distracting? No, because I know where I am at all times. But you're spotting. Yeah. There you, you go. You got a spot. You got it. Are there any moves you can show me to deputize me? We can do, we can do this move. So look at your hands. Hands, hands. They're going straight, so we just do this. That means they're going straight. Now he's going right. There you go. I never heard of crossing the street when a cop is directing cars. We're not that good. We can't do both. All right, let's talk about the rhythm of traffic that's moving smoothly. Is that a tango? Is it a cha-cha? Oh, is it a disco beat? It's everything all to combine because you can use almost every move that I have. If okay. it's slow, I have moves for slow traffic. If it's quick, I have other moves. I have funny moves. <laughs> and you're really using your butt. Yep. And a lot of traffic cops don't use their butts. Well, I've been doing this so long, I think they let me get away with it. Or is it that the butt has been underutilized by other traffic cops? Maybe it has, I don't know. Because it's almost like an extra limb with you. You've got it your is. arms. It is. And I'm not trying to really, it's showy, let's face it. But it's also, it works. That's what counts. It works. I've never had an accident on this corner in 25 years. All right, come on in, the water's warm. Next time on The Tomorrow Show, we'll look at what'll be hot in the spring of 2050. One moment I was standing here shirtless. Now, a few minutes later, I have a t-shirt on. How did this happen? The future of fashion. Until then, don't stop thinking about The Tomorrow Show.